Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Sober Bliss Meets. Today I am honoured and delighted because I'm joined by the gorgeous Jean McCarthy. Hello Jean. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm happy to be here. This is nice. It's a little funny to be on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, because most people will probably know you from The Bubble Hour, which is a hugely popular, inspirational podcast. And you also have a blog, don't you, called Unpickled. I do, Unpickled. I love that name. It's amazing. <laughs> it's just so true as well, isn't it? <laughs> Well, you know, there's, there's um, an old recovery adage that says uh, you can take the pickle out of the jar, but you can't turn it back into a cucumber. <laughs> and, but, I, but, you know, I, I didn't want to be a pickle anymore. So whatever a pickle is after it's out of the jar, that's, I guess that's what we are now. Yes, we are. We are definitely unpickled. <laughs> so today I'd like you to just talk about you, your journey, um, which is incredible because you're nine years alcohol-free now, aren't you? I am. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. How are you feeling right now? Um, well, like everybody, I'm in this weird in-between space of, of self-isolation and yeah. all the cycling stages of grief. But as far as recovery goes, I'm so grateful to have this in my life because mm -hmm. I feel like the the healing that I've done these past years and the growth, the continual process of growth that I've embraced has been very helpful. And when I think of where I was when I, before I uh, made these changes in my life, boy, I would not have done well under these current circumstances. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good and pretty grateful in spite of, you know, all the stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. Um, I'm only, well, I say only, it's amazing for me, two years sober now. That's huge. Um, but I couldn't think of anything worse if, you know, to be drinking right now. I think it would have just been a complete disaster for me personally. Uh, so like you, I am so grateful to be clear headed and have all my faculties around me at the moment, because I think we need it, don't we? Well, we do. And I really got to the point with my drinking that it became what I call a management problem. Like <laughs> there was the problem of needing the continual supply, having enough, mm -hmm. uh, consuming undetected, um, uh, trying to keep a lid on the escalation of, of it all, which I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that would have been very difficult. I'm married, so I'm isolating together with my husband. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was able to hide how much I was drinking from him and, and the kids who were home in those days. And um, I would have found that very hard right now. So I'm feeling a lot of compassion for anyone who is in active addiction right now and feels like the wheels are really coming off mm -hmm. because we set up our regular lives to mm -hmm. enable our addiction, right? We, we, uh, yeah. first, first we build our addiction around our life or our addiction kind of creeps in around the edges of our life and over mm -hmm. time, we start to change how we live in order to accommodate how we drink or use or fill in the blank. Yeah. And with these new parameters placed on everyone, I feel like the wheels would probably really be coming off of whatever um, balance people have tried to build around controlling their mm -hmm. addiction or feeling like they're managing it. So I'm just really feeling like there's a lot of people that must be really suffering right now. And I giggle as I say that because I guess, why, what was that? Was that a nervous giggle? It certainly wasn't a, haha, you're suffering. I mean, I guess it, that, that was a little bit of self-defense that came up of just old feelings of mm -hmm. um, whatever, just not wanting to to push against that memory of how it feels to be there. So I'm yeah. definitely feeling compassion for anyone who's going through that. And at the same time, 
Gail, aren't the resources just exploding right now? There are yeah. so many, so much content, so much outreach. And those mm -hmm. of us that do this kind of recovery advocacy, we have time to respond like we never have had before. So it's also a great time to reach out. It is, it is. And I think it's the perfect time to reach out as well because everybody is kind of coming together to help. A lot of the resources have been moved online so you don't have to physically go anywhere where you can't um, and it's just made it a lot easier because I think everybody is recognizing that there is this struggle at the moment and you know we're all coming together to help in any way that we can which you know hopefully if people are out there actively looking for support, then they will find the right support because, yeah, it, it is out there at the moment, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to take us back to nine years ago when you made the decision to change your life and why you did it and how you did it? Sure. I will. Um, sometimes when I think about this story and go back to where I was, uh, I have a physical reaction to it. Sometimes yeah. my voice starts to shake and or I cough or I get nervous or I start to sweat. Um, because even though it was nine years ago, um, it's, it's still really tender and really mm -hmm. raw. And um, I guess it, there was a long process before the day I quit of trying to quit and not quitting. Waking up every morning and saying, today's the day, I'm not doing it again. I am not going to drink today. This is it, this is a new day, I'm done. And then uh, my day would unfold, I'd get the kids off to school, I'd go to work. My husband and I owned a, a home building company, so, um, that was a oh, it was like not a huge business, but 13 employees, uh, mm -hmm. 12 or so houses under construction at any given time. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot yeah. on the go. Mm -hmm. And I was the um, kind of the spokesperson for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd had a long career in home building. I did a lot of uh, TV and radio work. I'd had training in um, you know, on camera presentation. And I, I had a weekly TV show um, uh, about housing on our local channel. And uh, we really kind of took advantage of the fact that I was comfortable on camera. I know a lot about the construction industry and people uh, found it a little bit novel at that time to hear about home building from a woman. Yeah. And so that just held their attention for an extra few seconds. And so uh, I definitely took the lead on that. And so I was the face of our family business. Mm -hmm. I was on the news on a regular basis because back then the local news was a big thing. <laughs> the yeah. local news channel and the local paper were a lot bigger than they are now uh, in a community. And so I, I was very visible and I was under a lot of pressure to be on all the time. Pressure that I put on myself. Yeah. And um uh, then additionally, I had a, um, a real need to perform, to achieve, to go, 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 go. And so we owned, uh, uh, I, let me think on the timeline. Prior to this, we'd owned also a little coffee house that was located near our business. So I ran that. And I was writing and performing music on the side because um, even though I was very busy with business, I had a degree in writing and writing was always very important to me. And so I had this kind of side life as a, as a singer songwriter mm -hmm. and my kids were teenagers. And I mean, the pace of my life was absolutely frantic yeah. and it was entirely mm -hmm. unnecessary for it to be that way. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to do that. And as I look back on it now, I realize I was always running from myself. I never wanted a minute of quiet, a minute of stillness. Um, if, if I look back on how my, my, um, my life was set up. It was very much um, 
speaking from behind a podium, singing from behind a microphone. It was like a one-way presentation mm -hmm. that garnered me um, uh, external approval, external validation. And, and yet I controlled the dialogue, uh, yeah. which is kind of funny now that I'm a podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I've grown in a way that makes me much more um, able to talk about myself. So I, I, um, I was on this go, 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 go. Mm. And how this relates to the drinking is that, as I said, I would go a million miles an hour all day long because I couldn't tolerate stillness. I couldn't tolerate introspection, um, silence. Uh, I had no peace. The idea of doing yoga was just completely a ridiculous too slow, too still, and, and way too much quiet in my head. There was no way I would do anything like that. Um, but we all have to go to bed at night. Yeah. And mm -hmm. no matter how tired you are, there is a moment when you crawl in bed and your head hits the pillow and stillness starts to descend upon you. And then it's just you and your thoughts, or you mm. and God, or you and your memories, you and your guilt, you and your shame. Yeah. And I was terrified of that moment every day. That's when the voices of unworthiness came out, the voices of um, uh, rumination on things that happened, things I was ashamed of, things I felt bad about. Um, moments of bad parenting, moments of bad judgment, something I might have said awkwardly during the day, it would just replay on loop. Mm. And if I, if I got into that, I was in for a long night of crying. And then, you know, you, or even 15 minutes of crying feels like a long night of crying. Mm. And then I would think, oh my gosh, well now I'm crying and I have to be on camera. There's a wee little bug. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get up my nose. <laughs> okay, composure. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I would, if I, if I did start to cry or not sleep, then I would worry because the next day I would think, oh, I've got to, on, I've got to be on camera in the morning, or I've got a big show tomorrow. How am I going to do my show tomorrow? I've got, I've got this big meeting. I've got X, Y, Z. I mean, whatever the next day held, it was way too much to begin with. There was no, mm. there was, I would have all this anxiety of how am I going to do it if I don't sleep? And if yeah. I look terrible because I've been crying all night. Uh, so I found this neat little trick, which was that if I had a nice big glass of wine, I would fall asleep very quickly. And that was very helpful at first because it worked. And as a decade at that breakneck pace wore on, and I kept adding more to my plate, um, and uh, kept getting tired, <laughs> more mm. and more tired. And really, I was just in a, a, a hamster wheel of dysfunction. I mean, obviously, that's not sustainable. Mm. And so when you put an addictive substance into the mix, and the fact that um, my family is of Northern European descent. There was a history of alcoholism in my genetic background, um, in my immediate family, as a matter of fact. Um, I was very susceptible. And so daily intake, uh, so that repetitious pattern combined with genetics, combined with a predisposition for a sort of codependent thinking, external validation, um, ego, ego, what is that, the egomaniac with the inferiority complex, like yeah. just all of that dysfunction, I just, you know, I fell into the pattern that unfolds for many, many people, and I think women in particular mm -hmm. in, in this day and age, and that was that one glass of wine became two, and um, two glasses of wine became two fish bowls of wine and you know half a bottle of wine became well more than half a bottle of wine a night I decided was problematic so I started buying boxes so that I couldn't see how much I was drinking mm -hmm. and um, hiding one box in the pantry so that I could swap it out without it really being too obvious that I'd already gone through a whole box uh, and then I was coming home from work earlier and earlier in the day. Um, that that struggle with myself 
that used to be, um, I'm not going to have wine tonight. Well, then it would be sort of an after lunch thing of, I'm going to leave early and I'm going to pick up alcohol on the way home. And mm. I'm going to have, you know, a margarita while I cook dinner, except I would drink the margarita out of the coffee, out of a coffee mug, <laughs> oh, even sorry. though I was home alone. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, and, uh, and sometimes I would put the coffee mug, I had a, a recipe stand for my recipe book in the corner of the kitchen. And sometimes I would tuck that mug behind the recipe stand and I was hiding my own drinking from myself. Yeah. And, you know, I felt, so little regard for myself that I really think my my idea was that it was okay if I knew because I didn't count what only mm. mattered what was what other people knew and a big part of my recovery has been learning to value my own opinion and learning that the things I know still matter mm. so um I also have dealt off and on with an eating disorder in my life and nobody knew about that. And so it was very easy for me to pretend that that didn't happen, didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And a big part of my recovery has been just accepting that I matter as much as anybody else. And if something happens and I see it, it still counts. Yeah. It's still trauma. It's still dysfunction and it still needs tending to. Okay. And that can sound ridiculous. It, it's, it sounds kind of silly to me now, but I feel like anyone who is going to be drawn to watch our conversation might be someone who can relate to this and mm -hmm. understand and, and, and feel like that actually makes perfect sense to them, yeah. that it's a completely foreign idea to accept that if you know something yourself, it still counts and it still needs healing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, okay, so I was caught up in this cycle of go a million miles an hour a day. And, and I didn't, um, the reason I was able to hide the extent of my alcohol intake from people was because I started drinking once I was safely home for the day. Mm -hmm. And I drank in such a way that I really timed it. I would even take alcohol to bed with me quite often so that I could just fall asleep the second before my head hit the pillow, the second before those thoughts started to unroll. And um, so in a way, I, I suppose you could say I was blackout drinking every night. But to me, I was using it as a sleep aid. Mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't blacking out before it was convenient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I was trying to stop and I couldn't stop and it was getting worse instead of better, I really knew I was on a trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to go where this was going to take me. I was very fearful. I was still um, had that belief that I think that old stereotype that um, – an alcoholic has to hit a rock bottom and have something terrible happen that then forces them in a dramatic scene from a movie to walk into a recovery meeting and fall on their knees and, you know, mm. have this, um, this idea that I had unfold. Yeah. And I did not want to have that terrible example, that terrible experience. I, whatever rock bottom was um, destined to be for me, I did not want to go there. I didn't want to get a DUI or a, a drunk driving charge. I didn't want to hurt someone else. I didn't want my children to see me um, passed out or, you know, wet my pants or like name your bottom, fill in the blank. Yeah. Whatever shame identity is, um, your idea of a shame identity, I didn't want that. And um, it was an epiphany, really, that I could just quit, that I could just stop the trajectory midair. Mm -hmm. And it, it came from outside of myself. It was a real, um, it was a powerful, inconvenient mm -hmm. epiphany that I had. Uh, it happened at an event I was at. I was hosting a table full of women at a, a gala, a women's award night gala. And um, there was wine on the table. And the uh, guest speaker was um, a, a motivational speaker. And, and so for part of her presentation, she wanted to talk about goal setting. And so she told everyone to close their eyes and think of a goal that was important to them. And I had um, 
a big birthday on the horizon, you know, and I, I thought, well, uh, I was in my early 40s at the time, and I knew that by my 50th birthday, I wanted to hike Machu Picchu. And so when she said, close your eyes and think of a goal, I thought, I'm going to think Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. And I closed my eyes, prepared to envision Machu Picchu, and I felt a hand, a two by four, I don't know what, something came out of the ceiling and smacked me on my chest. And the words in my head were, I need to quit drinking. And I gasped and I looked around the table because I was afraid I had said that out loud. And what I, I the, the feeling, the sensation of something hitting me on the chest was so real that I thought perhaps someone had a, like, thrown a bun from across the room. I don't know. <laughs> so I opened my eyes and looked around, but here all these other women at my table still had their head down and their eyes closed because they were doing the exercise that we were being led through. And so I thought, I told that voice in my head to shut up and I closed my eyes and I thought, I'm going to think about Machu Picchu now. Mm -hmm. And I closed my eyes and I felt it again. I heard it again. Wow. I need to quit drinking. And um, this is where I feel really emotional because I, it returns to my body. And the way I describe it is that um, if you see a child riding the bike, riding their bike on the street, and they're kind of wobbly, and they're about to tip, you know how you sort of lunge for them, you have that, <gasps> and you lunge, yeah. or if you saw a puppy headed towards the freeway, and how you, oh, your dog just barked on cue, <laughs> what a good dog, he's like, I don't like this example, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you saw a, a cat, let's say a cat, uh, headed towards the, a, a, a car in traffic, you would gasp and lunge. Yeah. That and lunge, that feeling hit me in my chest and stayed there. Mm. And I felt a, like a cartoon, you know, when the, when the coyote lunges for the roadrunner and he's like in midair. Mm. I felt like I was suspended in midair. With that feeling in my chest mm. and that's a very inconven inconvenient way to feel when you're in a professional setting yeah. a supposedly um uh, a gala so you're i was trying to be composed i was hosting these women i was a, a previous recipient of this award so i was sort of expected to um represent the the past award winners i mean i really was I really needed to stay composed in that moment. And yet I felt just completely naked and exposed. It was so powerful and I was not happy about it <laughs> because I really, um, my heart's desire was to, to quit drinking and my biggest fear mm -hmm. was to yeah. have to quit drinking. I wanted it to be anything but the alcohol, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that needed to change because I had developed, well, I had developed an addiction. Mm -hmm. And when you develop addiction, you develop addictive thinking. Yeah. You, you really are having a relationship with your ism. Um, I really believed in alcohol. I believed it made me um, more elegant. I believed it made me um, more sophisticated and that it added something to my life. And it was the part of my day I looked forward to. Mm. And I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't vocalize this then, but it was also the thing that stood between me and the thing I feared the most, which was those voices in the dark, that, that time alone with myself. Yeah. And so I think I did what any high functioning alcoholic would do in that moment. I ignored that voice and I finished the wine on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, only enough though that I could still drive. I had to drive home that night. So I was very careful about how much I drank, but I knew exactly what I had at home. I had a half a bottle in the fridge at home mm -hmm. and I went home and I drank that bottle, but I could not make that feeling in my chest go away. That was on a Friday night. I did not buy wine on the Saturday, but there was a bottle of red in the cupboard, and I usually drank white wine. Mm -hmm. So I drank the red wine on the Saturday night, which I wasn't used to. And on the Sunday morning, which was March 20th, 2011, I woke up with 
a horrible hangover uh, because I had drunk a bottle of red wine or most of a bottle of red wine the night before, which might make me sound like a lightweight, but um, mm -hmm. if anyone's listening that's kind of comparing how much they drink to how much anyone else drinks, here's my sidebar on this. Addiction looks for differences. Addiction yeah. looks for holes in people's story that will tell you, I'm not like her. Mm. I'm not like her. Um, but recovery looks for similarity. So if you're listening to this, listeners, I don't know where to look so that I'm looking at you, listeners. I feel like I'm shifting all around. <laughs> listeners, wherever you are, <laughs> yeah. if you're listening and uh, you're, you're picking out differences to justify why you don't, why, why, uh, this is wrong or we're not for you or you're okay mm -hmm. flip it listen for similarities recovery yeah. looks for similarities addiction looks for differences yeah okay so, so yeah <laughs> lesson lesson learned so um so uh i um <clears throat> i woke up that sunday morning and i had plans to hike with a friend that day and i felt awful and i still had that feeling in my chest and my fear had turned to excitement mm. and I thought I I think I could really do it I think this fear is something new I think I think something new is coming up inside of me that I've never felt before in the million and two times I've tried to quit and couldn't this is something new and maybe I can leverage this maybe this is the missing link yeah. and the other thing I really had never done uh, was tell anybody the truth Mm -hmm. I had done a lot of the the um, half cut talking to the other person I was drinking with saying ah, I drink too much I need to stop and I knew I knew I could count on them to say you're fine yeah. you don't need to because we were doing it together yeah so on on that day I was walking with a friend a dear friend who I trusted and um and I told her the truth. I told her I drank every day. I told her I, I wanted to quit. And I was trying to quit and couldn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I told her how much I drank and, and that it was escalating. And, um, and, you know, it's funny. I remember exactly where we were on the side of the hill during this conversation nine years ago, mm -hmm. I remember exactly where we were. And, um, and she said, holy, the, yeah, I could see why you need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot. And I'm surprised you've been able to manage, to, to manage it this far. Yeah. And I needed that because, again, I only valued what other people said. <laughs> I only valued the external mm -hmm. validation of someone telling me, uh, yes, you need to quit. And I, and um, uh, so that her validation that yes, this, this was a good idea together with whatever that, you know, that mysterious force. Um, I, I feel like something, um, the universe, you can put whatever label on it you want god the universe you know whatever mm -hmm. higher power something outside of myself was was calling me to scoop up whatever was left inside of me and put it to good use so yeah um and so that was my first day and it was hard and i didn't tell anybody because i my friend knew she was the only one that knew Mm -hmm. But here I was living uh, with my husband, and I think at that time only our youngest son was still at home. The other kids were away at school. I have three three sons; they're all uh, grown and married now. But nine years ago, they were they were young mm -hmm. teenagers. Um, so uh, the the next few days, I I secretly quit, just as I had secretly drank yeah. and I was afraid at this point that if I told my husband that I had quit drinking he would tell me I didn't need to because he didn't know how much I was drinking mm -hmm. and he certainly didn't know how much I was suffering yeah so um 
and I was really afraid of that. And the other thing I was afraid of, which I know now was not correct, but again, I think the addictive part of our brain fights really hard to stay in charge. I was afraid that if I walked into any kind of a recovery meeting, I, I won't even put a brand name on it. I only knew of a couple kinds, but it wouldn't matter. I was convinced if I walked into other a room with other people in it that were sober, they would tell me, get out of here. You're not that bad. We don't believe you need to be here. Mm. That doesn't happen. Mm. I, I, that doesn't happen. But I was afraid it would. Yeah. And I really, really didn't want anything to make me give up quitting this time. Mm. Uh, so I, I, um, my coffee cup that I normally was drinking tequila and margaritas out of, I was drinking some orange juice out of that or some tea. I, um, I really relied heavily on sugar to which as it turns out uh, is, a, is a useful tool because it can hit light up those pleasure reward pathways in the brain the way that alcohol does um, the flip side of sugar is that it, it can cause your blood sugar levels to spike and drop yeah. and that feels a lot like cravings so um, I guess I'm, I'm mixing up advice and my story now, but I'll, I'll sidebar some advice. So what I've learned since is that, um, so I, I was sucking on orange slices to, mm. it confuses your palate, first of all. So mm -hmm. try, try to avoid things that would have tasted good with your drink of choice. So um, savory things or anything that would have paired nicely with wine, I was avoiding snacking on those. Mm -hmm. And I found for me, fruit and sweets don't go well with wine. So when I had those things, I didn't miss having wine. And then the sugar kind of seemed to confuse my palate and make my brain happy at the same time. So uh, if, if you're relying on sugar to get you through the first few days of craving, throw in a handful of almonds or some cheese or some kind of protein with that to make your blood sugar levels not spike. Um, if you're super disciplined and you can handle doing this, a lot of people say go sugar free and, and really flatten out your um, blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, you know, it, the alcohol is the most important thing to get rid of. So yeah. pick your battles. But anyway, so I got through those first few days of just, um, of just replacing. Um, the, the, my brain was constantly, constantly begging me for wine. And I would just go to the fridge and get a snack. And I'd sit down and I'd eat it. And 10 seconds later, my brain would say, we need wine now we need wine now. And I would get up and go and get another little plate of oranges or my digestion was great at that point. My fiber intake was high. <laughs> anyway, uh, I did not tell my husband until 10 days later. Um, and during those 10 days, I went through, uh, uh, the feeling of detoxing from alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that was what really convinced me that I was physically addicted. I was in such denial that the amount of drinking I was doing could cause physical addiction. I mean, yes, I got up and took two Tylenol every morning, but you know, it was because uh, I also, did, you know, was doing a bit of running or, well, doesn't every woman in her forties have aches and pains, you know? And, yeah. um, you know, I don't do that anymore. Now I'm 52 and mm -hmm. I don't need Tylenol every morning, but I had convinced myself I didn't have hangovers but yeah. I did. So the, the feeling of physically detoxing was such a shock to me that that actually convinced me. Mm. Again, I really needed external validation, I guess, but that really convinced me that, um, that the addiction was real, was a real physical thing. And, um, and that was just so exciting to, to realize that I was doing it. And then, yeah. Know, two days, which I'd never really gotten through two days, three days, four days. And oh my gosh. I mean, then once I started to feel better physically, I didn't want to go back. I didn't mm. want to go through that again. Mm. And um, so that was really great. Uh, do you want me to talk about the blog and when the blog started? How yeah. The blog started? Yeah. I was going to ask you, because you seem to be kind of doing this all by yourself in secret in the beginning. 
And I imagine that's where the writing came into play. It did. So the credit again goes back to that motivational speaker mm -hmm. at the night when the universe slapped me, <laughs> <laughs> told me it was time to make a change. Um, it, uh, the, the, the lady who was speaking told a story about how um, for her mother's 90th birthday, she created a blog for her mother. And every day she wrote a little entry about a memory of her mother. And, uh, and she said, and only her mom was the only person who had the link to this blog. Oh. And she said to her mom, have you read it? Mom, did you read it yet? And, the, and her mother said, oh, yes, I did. And she knew that wasn't true because she could see the stats for her blog and she knew there'd been zero clicks yeah so uh so she said finally her mom confessed that she didn't understand what a blog was and so this lady uh went over and showed her mother how to read her blog and then uh, this for every day for a year she wrote a memory of her mother and they shared it you know and it became this beautiful relationship thing between them mm -hmm. this beautiful exchange and at the end of the year she published a book of mm -hmm. all of these memories and gave the book to everyone in her family mm -hmm. isn't that beautiful it is it's so lovely. and so I hung on to the what she said about a blog, which was that she could see a zero and then it went to a one. And mm. she, knew, she knew her mom was reading it every day. And I thought, if I wrote about this process that I'm going through, I would be able to see if one person read it. Mm. And again, now I know what that was, what I was doing. That's codependency, that's external, um, the need for external validation, the, the need for someone else to hear me in order for what I'm saying to be true. Mm -hmm. the, the, I was, I, I wanted to, I wanted to recover alone and yet I didn't value the, the only person who knew my secret mm -hmm. was me and my friend. Um, so I thought I'll start a blog. I, as I said, you know, I needed to, I knew I needed to do something differently mm -hmm. and I felt like I wanted support, but I was afraid if I went to a meeting, my little bug friend is back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <It's all> right. <laughs> I'm in Canada. It's, there's still a bit of snow here, you know, so bugs are, this is exciting to have oh. a bug in the house. This oh, means wow. spring's coming. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, uh, I, um, I did, I started this, I started the blog on my first day and I thought, um, I just need one person to see it mm -hmm. and then I'll know that I've told somebody yeah. and, and then I'll, I'll have to get to day two. And, and I didn't really understand how, how blog platforms worked. I mean, I'm pretty tech savvy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was easily able to set it up and use it. I ran our, our website at, at our business and you know we didn't get a lot of hits at all unless we advertised and so i thought if i just write this little blog and i'm not advertising it how many hits am i going to get like not very many i just need one i just wanted one yeah. and i also had in my mind that you know maybe a few months down the road i could take all these entries and maybe i could create an article or something for a magazine because isn't this unusual aren't I different? Aren't I completely like, unlike any other person who's ever been addicted to alcohol? Won't this be such a fascinating story to tell people about how this, you know, like boring woman who ha had her life together otherwise fell into addiction? Like this, no one's going to believe this. So, um, so I'll, I'll use this to get sober and then I'll, you know, it'll be this really novel tool down, uh, maybe I'll, in three months or so. I really had three months in my mind that mm -hmm. I would I would have the problem would be solved. I would be completely alcohol free and yeah. um and then uh, like store end of story, happy ending to story. So uh so I did that. I started the blog and um 
what happens with blog platforms is that they do the advertising for you in a way. They they sort of send out your um, your tags and your area of interest to other people that are on that platform, and so um, I immediately any blogger will get a handful of readers. Yeah. And I had I also had linked it to a new Twitter account. Um, for my blog, because uh, I wanted an anonymous Twitter account, and I didn't realize how much recovery was happening on Twitter, and so the, a link went onto this Twitter account, and then some dear, dear person um, picked it up and, and shared it and said, hey, everybody, this unpickled person is on her her his first day one they didn't know if i was a man or a woman um let's let's send some encouragement and so people went to my blog at maybe four or five and left a little comment and i woke up the next morning and saw this um my first you know 24 hours of sobriety mm -hmm. and um and here was all this support well oh. i cried it was such a relief and to hear you're not alone um it's simple it's no what is it it's it's simple but it's not easy keep mm -hmm. going um that was just like water on a cactus i mean it just felt so good mm -hmm. and so that kept me going and kept me going and then a few days into it maybe a few weeks into it well you know then comes this other thing that happened that I didn't expect because in my in my um, self-centeredness I kind of thought I was the last person that would ever get sober I didn't really think that anyone else was like me out there mm -hmm. well here a comment came in that said I'm on day one two weeks you're, you're two weeks sober that's amazing I'm on day one you're my hero mm -hmm. I'm gonna follow you to help me well then I thought oh my gosh I'm helping someone else. Well, now I really have to stay sober. Yeah. I had no idea the power of service. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I later learned is that service or helping others, mm -hmm. shining the light is so important. It's a step in, a, in the 12 step process. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's that important. It's that helpful. It, mm -hmm. it, it keeps us sober to it connect does. with other people mm -hmm. and to be not just accountable not just someone saying you know check the box if you're sober today but but to know that someone else's sobriety um, is affected by your sobriety by mm -hmm. your recovery that was news to me man so that was great these by accident i i started a blog with completely narcissistic you know uninformed hope i guess mm -hmm. and um and uh what unfolded you know it tore all that down and sometimes i look back on those old posts and they're just they're painful for me to see now because i mean not only because i was in a painful spot but because they just mm -hmm. sound kind of arrogant and privileged and um uninformed or unself-aware but i leave them up because mm -hmm. i i i need to own that part of my story yeah but also because that is part of where the cycle takes us all and so it's still you know i still get comments on those on those things that kind of cause me to cringe of people saying oh this sounds exactly like me mm -hmm. and to it's important for people to hear themselves and when i when someone does comment and say oh i'm exactly at this point i don't want to look at that person and think oh well have you got a lot to learn you know <laughs> yeah. i think it's important to say this is great you're in process you mm -hmm. know you're 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 you are off the hamster wheel and on a new trajectory of healing and i will meet you where you're at today Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I'll meet you where you're going to be tomorrow, because it's going to be a little bit different. It might be back a little ways. It might be forward a little mm -hmm. ways. But we show up as we are, where we're at, and we tell the truth. And we accept one another where we're at. And that is not how I ever lived my life before. Mm -hmm. That, for me, 
that's a whole new way to live. Mm. And it's scary a little bit. Yeah. And it's also really freeing. And I, I love how that new way of life has transformed me as a mom. Now I'm a grandma oh. as I have three grandchildren. Oh, Can you wow. believe it? <laughs> I know, I know. And that was a big fear of mine was that um, my oldest son got married the year before I quit drinking. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was very worried that if they found out how much I drank, uh, when they had children, they would never let me babysit. Yeah. I would, that was one of one of the reasons I wanted to quit mm -hmm. was because I knew that uh, if the truth came out, um, I would be, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't trust myself. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trust myself with a child. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be something I couldn't fool anybody with, right? I mean, I guess we all have our limits of what we're willing to fool people with. Yeah. So for me now to be the matriarch of my family and to be the grandma that you can call 24 hours a day, you never have to worry if grandma's been in the sauce. I can get in the car and come get you yeah. or come babysit. You know, I, I you can count on me. Mm -hmm. I might be tired. I might not know where I put my keys. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of other imperfections going on. But the one thing I am not, I am not drunk. I am not craving a drink. I am mm -hmm. not in withdrawal ever. Yeah. That's so that's, amazing. That's a good feeling. It is. And... Uh, my three sons are all married now, so I have three daughter-in-laws, and it's really important for me, for them, that uh, I am a, a, a good mother-in-law to them, mm. uh, a, a woman in their life that's a woman of honor and someone they can count on and look up to, and mm. um, that my relationship with my children is functional so that I don't become the kind of mother-in-law that's the punchline in the joke, you know, <laughs> or, or that they roll their eyes or your mother's on the phone, you know. Yeah. Uh, I want to be a positive force in their life, a supportive mm -hmm. force in their life, and not a burden. Yeah. So uh, it's all just the life I have now is so abundant and full, and, you know, sometimes it's messy and imperfect, but I never knew that I needed to heal this thing inside of me that relied on others to tell me who I am. I just thought I needed to quit drinking. Yeah. And the drinking was the symptom of other stuff. Yeah. I do have some, some old trauma in my past um, that... Uh, so I, I say that it's more like a, a thousand emotional paper cuts than, than a, a, a big incident that I can name. But there, there's some stuff in the past that has had to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's always a connection. There's often a connection between addiction and trauma. Yeah. So healing that has been important. But also healing the coping mechanisms I developed to try to cover up layer after layer of wounds and Mm -hmm. um, and also we inherit our parents' coping mechanisms too. And um, so I heard someone say that if a, if a ship leaves port just one degree off course, you know, mm -hmm. it, by the time it crosses the ocean, it hits the wrong continent. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be very far off track for it to take you somewhere far off course over time. Yeah. And um, so in healing these small seemingly small things that had big impacts on my life mm -hmm. I've completely changed how it feels to be me and I think that that changes how it feels to be around me and um, that makes me feel really good I'm really happy about that yeah oh it's so beautiful <laughs> you, from that place of shame and not liking yourself and not believing in yourself to where you are now, it's just so transformational, isn't it? It's just wonderful. It, so it is, except here's the thing. When you're super codependent and super hooked on achievement, mm. the world really likes that. 
and the world really rewards it. Mm -hmm. So from the outside looking in, I was very high functioning. I was a real achiever, a real go getter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, sometimes people are surprised, you know, they haven't seen me for 10 years in my community. I'm not on the news anymore. I, we've, we've since retired and I don't perform music anymore. Um, I'm, a, I'm kind of switched over to writing because then I don't have to stand up on stage. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not always scrambling for an award. I'm not hustling for my worthiness yeah. the way that Brene Brown puts it. It's so beautiful, hustling for our worthiness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think of old me as, you know, I was like a one man band. I was playing the cymbals with my knees and I was juggling and I was tap dancing and, yeah. and I, you know, had some kind of bikini on. I don't know. Like, you know, I just, <laughs> I was like a Las Vegas showgirl slash one man man slash, you know, I, I just was all motion and, Mm -hmm. that there was a level of sort of frantic dissatisfaction to it that I think gave me a real edge. And, and I kept people at arm's length because I didn't really want them to know that I didn't feel worthy of any praise. There was mm -hmm. no satisfaction. I mean, I did, I won some really impressive awards and I did accomplish some really amazing things and I didn't enjoy any of it yeah. or it was fleeting if I did because I didn't feel like I deserved it. Mm -hmm. I felt like this, this um, fake version of myself that I put on for the world every day, okay. she deserved it, but she yeah. wasn't real mm -hmm. and, I, and she wasn't me. She was a mask I wore. Yeah. And I had to learn to live with who I was when I took that mask off. And I sometimes say it was like I was, if I was tap dancing in a suit of armor and everyone thought, wow, that's a nice shiny suit of armor. But I knew that inside I was all sweaty, sweaty and pruney, you know, <laughs> and shriveled. Yes. And when I took the armor off and the, the fresh air and daylight hit me, it felt good. Mm -hmm but I wanted my armor back. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think the world wants us to put our armor back on too, because everybody likes the person who is begging for their approval. I mean, that feels good for other people too. So it's confusing. Mm -hmm. We get some mixed messages. Yeah, we do. So it took some work. And, and I, I think, Gail, that I went through some grief to say goodbye to that to that girl that I mm -hmm. that I held up as myself mm -hmm. and to say to learn to live without all of the external validation that she got mm -hmm. and to to become satisfied with the validation that I have from within and I kind of hid from the world for a while because I didn't really know it just took a while to learn to live in alignment with that Mm -hmm. And then when I got involved in the podcast, The Bubble Hour, which was already kind of up and established by the time I got involved in it, um, I had reconciled my need for external validation and I had found validation in myself. And I had learned that um, not to hook in to when people write in and say, I love the show, you got me sober. I tell them, nope, you got you sober. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy that this podcast is a tool in your toolbox or on your tool belt. I'm honored to do that. But the ownership for this is yours, not mine. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I learned that was because uh, when I first was blogging and nine years ago, blogging was still a pretty big thing. It's kind of, it's not as big anymore because social media has really transformed and yeah. kind of taken over. Uh, and that's fine. Everything evolves. Um, but I, my old ways had me kind of feeling good and my uh, sobriety was kind of propped up by the, um, by the uh, feeling of, of, other people mm. telling me that my blog was good or agreeing with me, agreeing with me. That feels good when people agree with us and tell yeah. us we're doing well. <laughs> <It does. Yeah. laughs> but if somebody wrote to me that had relapsed mm. or had decided sobriety wasn't for them, I was 
devastated. I just was devastated and I didn't know what to do with it. And I realized I was taking it as rejection. They were rejecting my sobriety. They were rejecting me. They were rejecting my point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. That's not true at all. It's not about me. It's about them. Yeah. And so I realized that I, I, you can't take credit and not take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? I don't know that, you know, you yeah. can't, you can't, you can't own the good stuff to intake the good stuff and not be affected by the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. The only way that I really felt that I could stay healthy and keep my ego out of the deal was to, um, know that my intention in doing these things is to tell my story and hold space for others. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, and to be real and authentic and honest and whatever process unfolds as a result of that is, has, is just nature. <laughs> it's yeah. humanity it has yeah. nothing to do with me. <laughs> and, um, and that, uh, and it's really best for everyone to own the outcome of their recovery. Mm -hmm. good or bad yeah and um so I realized that if I if I didn't want to feel the pain that was coming from the, the anything negative I had to unhook from from taking the positive stuff personally too yeah. I had to unhook from having a, a stake in in the positive stuff rather than just seeing it as positive and separate from myself Mm -hmm. So that was a, a new paradigm to me, and mm -hmm. it's had a profound impact on my life, because if this is true, yeah. this, is, this is game changer for my children, yeah. really, for my relationship with them. Mm -hmm. If their success or failure as humans or happiness or, you know, haircut has nothing to do <laughs> me <laughs> thank goodness you should see my children here at the moment <laughs> oh man yeah, so um it has a huge uh, impact on on all of my personal relationships mm. and on my attitude about everything really it, it has it has changed my life in so many ways mm. and as i said i really didn't think I was that bad before all of this. I just drank too much at night. Yeah. And I, I thought I just needed to change this habit. Mm. And it turned out that I had to basically take apart the entire, you know, Lego project and, and rebuild it a little differently. Mm. And it's much better this way. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what advice would you give to people who are watching this or listening to this and they maybe feel the same that, yeah, maybe I'm drinking too much, maybe I need to change, but they're scared of the unknown. They're scared that they too might have to change dramatically. Um, because that in itself is a scary thought. It's what kept me stuck for so long. I didn't know who I was going to end up being. Um, I didn't know if I would be me anymore. I wasn't quite sure how I, who I was, but at least I knew that it was me. And part of the fear of stopping drinking was like, who would I become? You know, what's going to happen to me? Um, and I also thought it would happen overnight, like one day I would be Gail who drinks too much beer all afternoon to the next day I would be this person that I'm not. And that really freaked me out a little bit as well. Um, so what would you say to somebody who's perhaps feeling that, that fear and that doubt? Well, um, I think that fear is often our addiction talking. Mm -hmm. And um, it helps to sort of almost personify your addiction, knowing that there's a part of your brain, a voice in your head, that has is very invested in your best interest. Mm -hmm. And over the years, it has been trained to believe that alcohol is in your best interest. And it's yeah. very wily, this voice. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be very manipulative, and it will pull out all the stops 
to make you believe whatever it you need to believe for it to achieve its goal of keeping the system mm -hmm. static, you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so first of all is identifying that voice and, and asking, is this really true? Or is this a narrative that my brain is constructing to try to protect me from something? Mm -hmm. That part of our brain also develops an intolerance sometimes for teetotalers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because they're no fun to drink with or because they make us uh, highly aware of how much we drink. And so over time, we develop a narrative that people who don't drink like us are no fun, mm -hmm. are disinteresting, are judgmental, are strange, are fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And that line of thinking also comes from that addictive part of our brain that, mm -hmm. is, that is working to maintain the addictive pattern. Yeah. Out of a misguided attempt to protect us. Mm -hmm. so, um, so learning to identify those voices and just see if you can uh, entertain the idea that maybe everything you think isn't exactly true. Mm -hmm. It's just a thought and it's just something you're telling yourself. Um, so just entertain that thought. And so maybe it's not true that that you are somehow a, the best version of yourself in your, in your drinking pattern, and that somehow a, a, a lesser version of yourself will emerge. This is, this is a story we tell ourselves. Mm, yeah. but let's hold that up and ask, what if this isn't true? Mm. And what else might be true? And what else might be true is that your highest and best self is under layer after layer after layer of behaviors and patterns and defenses that you've erected in front of it mm -hmm. and that it would really like a little sunlight and that the alcohol or your ism whatever it is you're doing for some people that's shopping for some people it's sex for some people it's alcohol for some it's drugs mm -hmm. for some it's gambling for some it's exercise you know yeah. We, we tend to fall into mm -hmm. addictive substances as being particularly shameful and troublesome <laughs> because uh, they alter our behavior and they've been sort of identified as, as you know, um, having a criminal component to them as well. So they have an mm -hmm. extra burden. Of shame. But whatever the ism is, fill in the blank, that's a layer between you and your best self. Just Or what if? Let's just entertain that idea. What if that is something that if we took that away, the version of you that emerges is perhaps uh, even more beautiful and radiant and uh, inherently perfectly you than you mm. ever imagined. And that what if that version doesn't need hiding, doesn't need protecting, but needs to just be allowed to shine a little bit? Yeah. So don't be afraid of that. And um, I think that something new will emerge and there will be a period of grief mm -hmm. that cannot be avoided. That is true. You might grieve alcohol. You might grieve um, the version of yourself you thought you were in drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's okay too. Yeah. Because on the other side of that, something new will emerge. And let's just be curious. Let's just explore who that person is. Let's explore who we are uh, without yeah. these layers on us. Mm -hmm. And let's know that it's possible to strengthen that person. And wow, I can just tell you, it really feels good to stand in my power mm -hmm. and the person I was trying so hard to hide and so hard to protect um, is, is just fine. She's just fine. I really like being her. Yeah. Uh, and it's much easier, so much easier. <laughs> uh, it's a relief, honestly. Yeah. And so, yeah, there will be, there, I, I won't lie. As, as that person said to me early on, it's simple, but it's not easy. Mm. It's simple. Don't drink. No, that's yeah. not easy. 
It's simple. Be yourself. That's not easy. It's simple. Tell the truth. That's not easy. <laughs> Yeah. But but then when you get to the other side of it, it, it really is actually easier to just be authentic mm. and to just to just be. And I was always bracing for impact. I was always bracing for judgment. Mm. I was I was always like a step ahead of what people might think or say or do. Yeah. I mean, you know, try and just like clench your fists, clench your body. That's hard to do, to stay that way all day. You know, when yeah. we do that emotionally, we're not meant to live that way. No. So it's just a relief to not have to live like ready for, um, like clenched in a protective kind of pose. Yeah. So, yeah, I think tell somebody mm -hmm. uh, is, is great advice. Um, you don't have to go through it alone is great yeah. advice. Particularly yeah. now, there are online meetings all over the place. You can mm -hmm. cover up your camera and observe. And yeah. that's, a, that's a great start. Slant onto an online meeting. You can call yourself, you know, Bugs Bunny or Trixie Magoo and cover your camera mm -hmm. and just listen in. Yeah. And um, that's not voyeuristic. You know, don't feel guilty about that. Just listen and see. Do you know, does that sound familiar? Does that mm -hmm. feel comforting? Mm -hmm. And you listen uh, from that place of recovery, looking for similarities, and know that if you catch yourself uh, ticking off lists of differences, I'm not like that, I'm not that bad, I'm worse than them, I'm better than them, mm -hmm. um, that's your addiction talking. And it's just trying to protect you. You can ask that voice, you know, thanks for coming, but take a seat. I'm in charge here, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and bring your higher self forward and approach from a mindset of recovery of what if, what if all this that I've built around myself isn't really true mm. or necessary? Let's take it apart. Let's be curious and brave and let's be willing to, to find out who I really am Mm. and what I'm really like and what it really feels like to be me yeah wow thank you that's so You're lovely welcome. thank you so much um yeah I could talk to you all evening Jean I really could you're such a a gorgeous voice to listen to you really are and I do appreciate so much you coming on here to talk to me Thank oh, so thanks much. for inviting me. I love seeing you. I hope I'm you not, do? I feel like I'm being shifty. Uh, no. To me, I love seeing you. So I, I've interviewed you on the Bubble Hour. Yeah. And, um, and so your voice is familiar to me. And, you know, you are, we're, we're in like uh, different continents and to see your face and your yeah. voice and to connect is just, it's so, it never gets old, does it? Like, it's just yeah. so amazing. It is. It is. And to feel that um, our cross, our paths all cross somehow. Um, we're lucky we get to see each other and, and, and have a conversation. But, um, you know, before I was doing this uh, in, in terms of the podcast, I was, mm. I was walking my dogs for hours a day and listening to podcasts yeah. and having conversations in my head mm. with the people. Sometimes I would pause the, you know, they would ask a guest a question and then I would just pause it and I would imagine my answer. Yeah. I mean, it just feels so good to have interaction with other people and, um, and to see the beautiful faces of people mm -hmm. in recovery is just, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's just the most powerful thing. So thank you for shining your light and for inviting me here today. Oh, it be my pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.